looks like it is about time to get started. People are still coming in. Um, as per usual, I'll take the first few minutes to uh, say a few words and then we'll pass the baton to our presenter, Nick Teague. Nick, thank you. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Um, so the general agenda will be as such. Uh, <clears throat> we'll start the community discussion uh, immediately after the intro. Uh, and by a quarter after, we'll be uh, passing the baton over to Nick, um, who will go for, and generally take us to the end of the hour. I need to update this slide because it doesn't usually work out like this in reality. Um, Nick will be taking questions, I'm sure, throughout, um, and we'll go to the end of the, uh, the allotted time. Uh, so, a few updates. Uh, let's see. I am going to mute everyone, and uh, once we get into the community section, if you've got something to contribute, you are more than welcome to and encouraged, in fact, to unmute yourself and chime in. Uh, a few words on upcoming meetups. Uh, we have a, uh, we're booked through November, which is awesome. Uh, we'll be hearing about Deep Mimic in August. Uh, in September, Quaternion Neural Networks, um, and in October, Active Learning, and uh, November's uh, is Mahesh, that's still TBD. Uh, if you're interested in presenting, you are strongly encouraged to do so, and uh, visit tumalaya.com slash meetupcfp to uh, express your interest and share what you are interested in presenting. Uh, presenting is, is obviously the best way to dig into a paper and, and learn. Um, and of course, we all get the, the benefit of learning as well along with you. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the FAST AI study group continues um, and the, the folks that are following along with that, I think are having a great time with it. Once we open it up, um, you know, I'd love to hear from folks sharing about, you know, what their experiences are with that and, and what they've learned and, uh, you know, things we can do better, all that stuff. Um, but I think there's, you know, even with the fast AI course, there are a bunch of folks, the, the folks who are kind of continuing to be involved are a small, a uh, small fraction of the total number of folks that have expressed interest in kind of having a group support for going through that course. And, um, you know, I picked the time of our study group meetings for my convenience, um, you know, certainly doesn't work for everyone. And so, you know, one thing that would be very cool is if someone wanted to start uh, a study group for, you know, fast AI, another course, the deep learning.ai course, you know, something like that. Uh, we are happy to, happy to uh, you know, help promote it, lend support, um, lend infrastructure via the, the meetup Slack uh, and, um, you know, post the videos for you. All you need to do is, you know, show up when it's time to kind of lead a, a group discussion and, uh, encourage folks to contribute. So if you're interested in, um, you know, leading a group to work on a, you know, a course that is, you know, convenient for you in your time zone, whatever, uh, let me know. Let me know. I think it'd be great to have more folks do that. Uh, Nick, you know, the routine in terms of Q and A, um, you know, folks will be submitting Q and A via Slack as well as the, uh, the chat here on Zoom, and uh, <clears throat> you don't need to worry about keeping an eye on that. I will uh, follow along with those questions and interrupt you from time to time to, uh, to address them as they come in. Uh, so it is five after and time for our open discussion segment. Uh, as usual, kind of fair game topics here are, you know, any of the things I just mentioned, questions and comments about recent podcasts, 
uh, topics or guests that you'd like to hear from. You know, certainly we'd love to hear more about what you are working on or what's caught your interest uh, in general in the, the research community or the industry over the past, uh, past few weeks. Interesting new papers or projects that you've seen, articles, news items, uh, what is up and what's on your mind in this space. And I will, uh, I'll just unmute everybody and we'll see if that works. Uh, otherwise, uh, well, we'll, we'll try that. And I'll just play whack-a-mole for the uh, background noise. All right, so who wants to go first? Uh, I'd be happy to go first, Sam. Uh, uh, there's a really interesting paper that was published by the OpenAI blog about uh, a generative, uh, reversible generative model uh, called the GLOW. Uh, it's it's like a flow based, but uh, it, it's a it, it's a new type of generative model, and it uh, actually looks pretty interesting. Nice. So I was just going to recommend you know check that out. So. I also, there's another one on the OpenAI blog. I saw that, but I have not had a chance to take a look at it. There's also, uh, is this the one you're talking about, Glow? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, I, that caught my eye as well when I was looking forward to reading it. I haven't played with uh, with their, their toys yet. I guess I'm playing with their toy now. That's pretty spooky. Uh, it, it's, it's an alternative <laughs> to GANs and variational autoencoders but it allows for like a training of the latent space uh, and potentially, uh, you know, customized uh, generative, you know, per application. So it's kind of- Okay. Oh, that's neat. This uh, image here is Dirk Kingma. I did a, an interview with Dirk as part of our OpenAI series and he is, uh, you know, he was the, one of the co-authors on the original variational autoencoder paper. Uh, so interesting to see how that work is combining with Gans here. Awesome. Uh, who else? What else have you uh, come across? Anybody working on any interesting projects? Does the fast AI course count? <laughs> I mean, what have, what have you, uh, what do you, what it, where, well, how far are you, are you? Are you up to lesson five or are you past lesson five or catching up or what? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm barely keeping pace with uh, the pain of your meetups. <laughs> I'm trying. Uh, so for those who aren't following along with the Fast AI study group, we, uh, the first few lessons, there are seven lessons and the first few lessons uh, you can go through pretty quickly. Uh, first three lessons, in fact, we were going through at kind of a week per lesson clip and everything. Uh, everyone was fine with that. Once lesson four came around, uh, it gets a little bit more, let's say a little bit more detailed um, and there's a lot, a lot more involved. And so we decided to, uh, I did a poll and folks said, you know, basically, uh, you know, let's add a, an extra session to create a part two for lesson four, you know, just for lesson four. Uh, but let's not, uh, you know, let's not stretch out or extend the course, you know, we'll all catch up at, you know, after doing a part two for lesson four. Um, and lesson five is even more in depth. And so uh, it was requested that I reissue that poll. I did that. And uh, at the last time I looked, it was 11 out of 11 respondents uh, said, nope, you know, it's probably not getting any better. Let's go to a two week per lesson uh, cadence. So uh, the course has been really interesting. We've talked about, um, you know, the first three lessons are basically focused on how to build a world-class uh, video, you know, object detection system using CNNs and uh, it turns out that, you know, using frameworks like PyTorch and particularly with the, uh, the fast AI library on top of it, uh, you can do that in like under 10 lines of code. It's pretty amazing and it's pretty formulaic how you go about that. Uh, and then lesson four introduces this really interesting twist, right? So you tend to think about deep learning 
in, in terms of uh, use cases like this glow, you know, where you're manipulating images or audio or some, you know, rich media or maybe text. Uh, and lesson four, a good part of lesson four is focused on, you know, what they call uh, tabular data, which, you know, is also relational data or business data and how you can use deep learning and, uh, and what, what they call entity embeddings to, um, to build models around that kind of data, you know, which apply to, you know, more traditional business types of situations. So, there's an example of, you know, Pinterest, how Pinterest used to do uh, related pins. Like, so you go to a Pinterest page, you pick up a pin and they're trying to recommend you other things you might like. They used to do that basically by looking at the space of all the pins that other people who liked that pin liked. Uh, and so they switched to uh, this entity embedding model which uh, provides kind of a much richer way for them to uh, identify the, the pins that a given user might like because it's much more kind of higher dimensional and it's uh, using deep learning. Um, and there's, there are examples with, uh, with Instacart. Uh, Instacart is using it to determine the ideal pick order for their pickers who are going shopping for people uh, it's been used, uh, Stitch Fix, I think mentioned they used it. Um, Google has talked about it extensively. Well, I don't know if they talked about it extensively. Jeff Dean mentioned it in the podcast I did with him. Uh, and in fact, Mahesh at the last, uh, study group did a, a presentation on these entity embeddings, uh, something that he's really excited about and, uh, is going to be sharing that presentation. Uh, actually, while well, the, the recording will be posted uh, momentarily, shortly, if it's not already up. Uh, but anything you want to add to that, Mahesh? Yes, uh, you know, the more I read about it, the more exciting it is. And uh, uh, as, I, I, as you rightly said, a lot of companies are doing it. Very few people are talking about it. And I, I think we are going to see much more. Uh, I also plan to write a couple of papers in this, uh, on a couple of medium posts after I send you the presentation. Okay, so, awesome, so. awesome. Good, Seth, you want me to write for your book then? Uh, no, uh, Geekbench 4.2. Oh, just Geekbench? Yeah, okay. Geekbench 4.2. Uh, so I don't think that conversation was meant for us. If it was, uh, you can unmute yourself again. <laughs> but uh, uh, Pete mentioned that he got started this week through the first two videos playing with the dog breed model and the planet Amazon models. Pretty awesome. It is definitely true. Uh, and for everyone who, you know, hasn't started or has started, but, you know, got slowed down, like stick with it uh, and, you know, reach out to the group for support. The folks uh, on Slack have been super supportive um, and helpful uh, in uh, helping folks out. Kai, who's been very active uh, in the Slack group and in the meetup, has developed some documentation for the Fast AI library itself. Um, very good stuff. All right, cool. Well, uh, Nick, I think it is time for me to turn over uh the screen to you um everyone uh nick has volunteered to talk to us about quantum machine learning today a uh, paper by jacob biamonte and others uh and nick uh take it away okay i'll share my screen Right, can you guys see that? Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, let me just figure out the video here. Okay, uh, I'll go ahead and jump right on in. So um, the topic of this discussion is going to be around the intersection of uh, two emerging fields, uh, quantum computing and machine learning. Uh, it's going to be a two-part talk. Uh, I'm going to cover a lot of ground pretty quickly. Uh, and um, obviously, you're welcome to ask questions at any time. Uh, I will have slots uh, for questions at the midpoint and at the conclusion. 
So, uh, it, you know, it, it, the preferences you can hold till then, but it, obviously you're welcome to ask questions at any time. Uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Nicholas Teague. I'm a professional in the renewable energy industry. I have a background in marketing, engineering, and procurement. Uh, and then uh, that's my day job. And for fun, uh, I write on Medium, uh, essays, uh, address of emerging technologies, as well as some creative writing. Okay, so part one of this talk is uh, an adaption of a blog post that I published in 2016 which is basically kind of an overview of some of the fundamentals of quantum computing. And, and the goal is that uh, through this discussion, uh, you'll have a better idea of what it means when people talk about quantum computing, uh, just kind of the fundamental concepts. Uh, I'm going to take it for granted that uh, uh, you have, in the interest of time, that uh, you guys have some familiarity with uh, some of the fundamentals of quantum dynamics. I'm going to use concepts like, uh, I, I mean, obviously it's not a simple subject, but I'm gonna use concepts like superposition, uh, interference, entanglement, and measurement, and those are gonna come up. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I'll, I'll point you to some, some uh, reference literature uh, if you'd like to learn more. And obviously I'll be here to answer questions as well. Um, so I'll, I'll start with kind of a highlight of an important figure in the industry. Uh, 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 obviously a well-known physicist by the name of Richard Feynman. Uh, he was a physicist first, but he was also uh, fairly well-rounded. He was infamous for picking locks at the Manhattan Project. Uh, he was an accomplished bongo drummer, uh, a visual artist, as well as a writer of many popular books, uh, ranging from uh, bi autobiographical personal anecdotes to uh, more technical matters like physics and computation. Uh, some of his books that I'd recommend, uh, the first one I read was QED, which is a very accessible uh, treatment of uh, quantum electrodynamics, which is a good introduction to some of the considerations of quantum theory. And then from a computation standpoint, uh, his lectures on computation, which was a class he conducted at Caltech, uh, has been assembled into a book, and it's a great introduction to computer science. And then there's also an excellent companion book, uh, which um, uh, addresses some of the frontiers of computing and is very relevant to the subject matter. Uh, so I, I've heard it uh, said uh, in a paper by uh, the physicist Marie Gelman that uh, Feynman's biggest contribution was uh, discovering how to sum quantum histories using the path integral method. And he's obviously very well known for visualizing subatomic particle interactions in Feynman diagrams, uh, which he painted on the side of his van. Uh, so, you know, these are just a, a few of the things that he's known for. He had a lot of contributions. Uh, and with respect to quantum computing, uh, uh, his uh, kind of call to action uh, it was a talk in 1981, which brought a lot of attention to the field. And it was a talk called Simulating Physics with Computers, where he basically uh, asked for researchers to investigate uh, ways to incorporate systems with quantum behaviors to improve our ability to simulate natural systems that are outside the reach of classical computers. So when we talk about um, classical computers and quantum computers, uh, the most typical way that they're introduced is based on kind of the fundamental building block of computation, uh, which is uh, the bit versus the quantum qubit. And uh, in classical computing, uh, our, our paradigms of digital computing have uh, all basically been different realizations of systems that can achieve some binary state, uh, which is you know, represented by zero or one, which are then uh, form a computation via progression through a series of logic gates. And the logic gates basically take an input of zeros and ones, and then based on the type of gate applied, apply a defined output of zeros and ones. And uh, with a sufficient set of gates, it's possible to reproduce any digital circuit, uh, which is, gives you computational equivalence to a Turing machine or universal computing. And, and you know, some of the different paradigms of digital computing have been things like electromechanical systems, vacuum tubes, relays, transistors, and then our current generation are integrated circuits. So with quantum computing, it's actually gonna be an entirely new paradigm uh, outside of the paradigms of digital computing, such that uh, the basic building blocks of computation instead of bits uh, will uh, be quantum bits or qubits, which take advantage of a quantum superposition uh, between the two states, zero and one, uh, that is up until the point that you measure the state, and then the act of measurement causes that superposition to collapse and you end up with a classical state. 
So what is it we mean when we talk about a superposition of a qubit between the post-measurement states of zero or one? Uh, this slide is kind of uh, inspired by some of the lectures of Scott Aronson. And um, basically, uh, a naive way to think about this might be to say that uh, there exists some probability of a measurement generating a zero or a one for a particle in superposition, such that we could describe it as uh, the state of the superposition is the sum of the probability of a measurement generating a zero plus one minus that, one minus that probability, which would then sum to unity. And it turns out this is insufficient to describe the full range of behaviors that are illustrated and uh, that are that are realized in quantum superposition. superposition. Uh, so if we wanted to get more creative, we could uh, allow for those classical probabilities to have positive and negative values. Uh, and then um, we could subject to the constraint that the probability of uh, a measurement generating a zero squared plus the probability of a measurement generating a one squared sums to one, which you could visualize the, on a point of the exterior of a circle. Uh, it turns out this is also insufficient to describe the full range of behaviors that are demonstrated by particles in superposition. So the, the, the actual way that we can visualize and represent a, a qubit in superposition is by an analog to classical probability, uh, but allowing for it to be both positive and negative, as well as real and imaginary. So it's a complex scalar. And if you subject that to the constraint that that quantum version of probability, the absolute value squared of a measurement generating a zero and a measurement generating a one, uh, sums to unity, and that gives you the correct way to describe a qubit in superposition. And you could actually visualize that superposition as the point on the exterior of a spherical shell. And in quantum computing, that, that spherical shell is known as the block sphere. And so basically, this is a way to visualize what we mean when we say that a qubit is in superposition. So uh, the block sphere uh, basically it is, has an analog of classical computing of the classical bit, which is just one of either a zero or a one. Uh, the block sphere has a, uh, you know, poles. Uh, the north pole represents the, the state collapsing to a zero, uh, the bottom pole of the state collapsing to a one. And um, it's, uh, it's from that complex scalar representation that we can derive a classical probability of a measurement generating a zero or a one. Uh, it's worth note that, you know, there's some limitations of the block sphere representation. It's primarily meant to visualize the state of a single qubit in isolation. And as you incorporate additional qubits with resulting interactions and entanglements, uh, the dimensionality of the system goes up beyond what we can uh, represent using pencil and paper. So now that we've talked about what we mean when we talk about a qubit in superposition, let's talk about the physical realizations of how we actually build a qubit. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, uh, but I just want to highlight that there's uh, several competing architectures uh, that are being uh, investigated and researched uh, for commercial application. And basically, each one of these architectures is just some system that has uh, quantum uh, properties which can be measured, manipulated, and controlled. And some examples include the, the quantum superposition of an ion spin of an electron spin, a photon polarization, uh, the superposition of a magnetic flux, and, and basically things like that. And, uh, and you know, they're not all equivalent. Some of them uh, have the potential for more scalability. You can incorporate working systems with more of them and with current technology. And is also, uh, some of them are more robust to errors and decoherence. And then some of them have different potential gate architectures. Uh, I'm gonna highlight uh, one particular architecture because it's going to come up more when we get to the quantum machine learning considerations. Uh, that is a, an architecture that makes use of the flux qubit, which is uh, the quantum superposition of a magnetic spin. Uh, and it, with that, we, we can uh, have what we call adiabatic computing. Uh, some of the physical practical uh, considerations include that it requires refrigeration to near absolute zero for superconducting purposes, uh, as well as heavy shielding from electromagnetic interference. Uh, so the, the first ones to market with this type of computer is a company called D-Wave. And uh, their current generation has 2,000 qubits. And from what I understand, their next generation will be upwards of 5,000 working qubits. However, uh, something unique to this architecture is that uh, it lacks a sufficient gate set for universal quantum computing. 
So uh, the adiabatic computing architecture is a special purpose machine, uh, which a uh, key application being quantum annealing, which is a kind of optimization algorithm. So and we in machine learning are obviously uh, very familiar with optimization algorithms, uh, generally backpropagation. Uh, and you know, obviously the goal, if we have some fitness landscape, uh, which could be a set of weightings for a neural network, for instance, uh, the goal is to uh, find the low point in some fitness landscape. Here is a 3D one for visualization purposes. Obviously these can be much higher dimensionality than just 3D. Uh, and then uh, as far as quantum annealing is concerned, there's a classical computing version, with, which is an analog called simulated annealing, which is realized by exploring that state space using randomized perturbations or thermal jumps, which are gradually stepped down in intensity. So the quantum computing equivalent uh, is what is realized with adiabatic computers, uh, and it's called uh, quantum annealing. And in, in addition to the thermal jumps for exploring the state space, it also makes use of the superposition for what's called quantum tunneling between points. Now, if we want to explore applications beyond quantum annealing, we'll need a universal quantum gate set. And uh, so let's just quickly talk about what we mean when we talk about a quantum gate. And obviously a gate in classical computing uh, takes an input of zeros and ones and forms an output of zeros and ones. Uh, this, you know, the superposition of the qubit as a state is a little more complex. And the actual realization of the application of a quantum gate is realized kind of uh, via uh, linear algebra. Uh, the superposition is a vectorized state and uh, the application of a quantum gate is realized through the multiplication with a, some unitary matrix. And, and, and can I jump in with a, a question and also give folks a, a chance to ask questions before we yeah, yeah, transition of course. from the qubits to, to more complex uh, aspects? Uh, yeah, I guess my question is like fundament is, is a little bit more basic. Like is the qubit is, how do you articulate like what the, the qubit is a physical manifestation of? Sure. So, uh, you know, th there's different uh, architectures that are competing for adoption and, and, um, Basically, each one of these is some system, uh, generally, you know, the you know, atomic scale or, or so, uh, that uh, has some quantum properties. And, and, uh, and it's, a, it's a system that we can, uh, it, what makes for a good qubit is the, our ability to uh, interact with it and to measure it and to, uh, and to have uh, form gates to manipulate the superposition. Okay, so a qubit, it... it it doesn't correspond to a specific single thing. It's, you know, it can be implemented in a, in several different ways. It's just some, you know, where we've isolated some kind of quantum property that is probabilistic in nature. Like, you know, so, some electron where we kind of know where it is probabilistically or something like that. Well, it, it, the analog in classical computing is uh, a bit, which can be realized either uh, in an integrated circuit or as a transistor, which has a zero or a one state. So mm -hmm. all this is, is think of it as just kind of a quantum transistor that uh, it, it allows for, uh, once you measure the state, it, it collapses that superposition and it realizes some you know, classical state of zero or one, but uh, prior to measurement, it's, it's in a quantum superposition. Okay. Any other questions? Either via voice or chat or Slack meetup channel. All right, cool. Um, so uh, we were talking about quantum gates and uh, the application of the gates realized, uh, basically the way to picture uh, the application of the gate on a single qubit is we talked about the block sphere representation, which is a way to visualize the superposition. And so as you apply a single qubit gate, what you're doing is taking that, that superposition, which is represented as the point on the exterior of a spherical shell and rotating it around one of the axes. And so that's for a single qubit. And then obviously as uh, we incorporate uh, multi-qubit gates, uh, the uh, interactions and entanglements uh, become a little more complex. And it's through the application of these quantum gates 
that we can implement our quantum algorithms and you know realize entanglement and things like that. So we have sufficient vocabulary now to talk about the quantum model of computation. And uh, it, it's, I have here just a representative circuit diagram. And uh, these are read from left to right. Uh, basically, the left side of the diagram represents an input of qubits prepared to some classical state. Uh, in this case, we, we prepare the qubits as all the ones. And then uh, the application of the gates are a series of unitary matrix transformations on the vectorized uh, superposition, which generate interactions and entanglements between the qubits. And then it's uh, the right side of this diagram, the dials here represent the act of measuring the state of the qubit. And through the act of the measurement, uh, the superposition of the qubits collapse. And so we lose some information in the act of measurement. As a result, the actual output of a quantum algorithm isn't going to give you an answer with 100% certainty. It's going to follow a probability distribution. And so there's re a requirement for some repetition of the, the steps of calculation until you reach satisfactory probable certainty. So I'm just going to highlight a few examples of quantum algorithms just to give you a flavor of the type of uh, the most fundamental. Uh, th these will come up a lot in the literature. So that if, you, if you're reading more about, you'll, I'm sure you'll come across these. Uh, one of the earliest algorithms to be discovered uh, was called Shor's factoring algorithm. And uh, this is uh, a, a application of factoring numbers, uh, which obviously has uh, applications in cryptography. Uh, and just, to, I'm not gonna explain obviously the workings of the algorithm, but just to give you a flavor of, of how it goes about doing that. Uh, it makes use of a quantum version of the Fourier transform, which enables uh, phase estimation, uh, which is uh, used in the factoring operation. Uh, so that particular algorithm allows for an exponential speed up versus classical computers. You know, problems that would take computer, a uh, classical computer some amount of time can be exponentially sped up uh, using quantum resources. Uh, another uh, example is a Grover search algorithm which is a type of database search application. And um, I, I wanna be careful how I describe this because uh, uh, Scott Aronson is known to hammer home the point that quantum computers don't just work by putting everything in a superposition and picking the right one, but uh, there's a kind of uh, amplitude amplification uh, of the state space such that as you have your uh, database put into a superposition, uh, the algorithm works to reinforce the solution and then cause the other portions of the database to interfere with each other. And it's through that application that uh, you realize a speed up in a, in a database search, uh, which it, it's not actually as much of a speed up as Shor's factoring. It's only a quadratic speed up. Uh, and then another important category, which is a little more recently developed, uh, is called the harrow hesedin lloyd algorithm. Uh, this has applications in uh, linear equation solving, you know, basically a uh, basic linear algebra. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it has wide applications as well. Uh, and you know, there's many more uh, algorithms out there. A uh, good resource I found if you want to learn more about the types of algorithms that are available uh, is a page published by NIST uh, called the Quantum Zoo. So if you just uh, type that in the, uh, the search engine, it should come up. So <laughs> we've talked about quantum computing. Uh, we've talked about uh, algorithms. Uh, now we'll just kind of jump up a few levels of abstraction and talk about computational complexity, uh, and uh, it, which basically helps to illustrate what exactly it is we'll be able to achieve with quantum computers. So uh, computational complexity is a way that uh, computer scientists uh, categorize and classify the types of problems that can be addressed by computers. And uh, this here is a, a subset of some of those categories uh, that, that are uh, studied. And uh, it illustrates the type of problems that can be addressed with classical computing resources, as well as quantum computing resources. Uh, this diagram can be read uh, from the bottom to the top as uh, increasing uh, uh, resources required to address a problem. Uh, and basically, it, it describes the scaling of resources that are required with increasing problem complexity. Uh, so some of the important classes, I won't talk about them all, uh, but P stands for the polynomial class. And this is the class of problems that a classical computer uh, can solve uh, with scaling in polynomial time with increasing problem complexity. 
uh, which is, for example, the type of problems that you can address using your personal computer. Uh, another important class is uh, NP, which is non-deterministic polynomial. And these are a class of problems that can be, that require exponential scaling of resources to solve. But once you have a potential solution, uh, checking and confirming you have the right answer, it only requires polynomial resources. Uh, and so that kind of quirk of the NP class has led some to speculate, well, maybe P and NP are in fact the same class. Uh, and it turns out all you need is one example of solving an NP problem in polynomial time, and you can prove uh, that that's the case. And there's even a million dollar prize uh, if, uh, if, if you have a spare weekend sometime to give that a shot. Uh, the smart money is that uh, it, it's, it's uh, probably not the case, but I don't think anyone's be able to prove it or disprove that conjecture with certainty. Uh, and then as we get to quantum computing, uh, the BQP set stands for those class of problems that can be solved uh, scaling and polynomial resources uh, using quantum computing resources. And, and I guess what's being illustrated here and uh, some of the key takeaways is that the polynomial set is a subset of the BQP set. So basically any problem we can solve with classical resources, we can also solve with quantum resources. That's not to say we would, the overhead of error correction and stuff for quantum computers is much higher. And so generally, if you can solve a problem with classical resources, you're probably gonna do so. But uh, another key takeaway is that there's more problems that can be addressed with polynomial scaling of resources using quantum computers uh, than uh, are available to us with classical resources. Uh, another important takeaway is the, the dashed line uh, representing the boundary of this BQP set uh, is uh, illustrating that the actual boundary of this set is not known with certainty. And, and uh, there's still a lot of research being conducted of the types of algorithms that are available, uh, which may or may not change this distribution. Uh, so, uh, you know, we talked about is P equal to NP. Some people have wondered, is BQP equal to NP? And I've seen that uh, some demonstrations that uh, Grover search algorithm, which is only a quadratic speed up versus classical computers, uh, is optimal. Uh, meaning um, that that's probably not the case, that BQP is probably not going to be equal to NP. So if you'd like to try to implement some of these algorithms, uh, some of the resources available in the commercial market, uh, there are, you know, commercial, prop, uh, com th there are resources available now. Uh, Rigetti and IBM both have gate-based quantum computers, uh, which target universal computation. And then uh, D-Wave, which we talked about earlier, is a special purpose computer for adiabatic computing. And uh, they each have their own API and cloud service, uh, as well as uh, uh, lots of educational materials. So that's good resources to learn more. And then there's obviously a lot more uh, platforms under development that are not yet available uh, on the commercial market. Um, you know, some of them include Microsoft, Google, Fujitsu, uh, Xanadu, Intel, and IonQ, some large companies and startups as well. Uh, some literature I'd recommend if you'd like to learn more. Uh, a very accessible work is uh, Quantum Computing Since Democritus by Scott Aronson. It, it addresses quantum computing as well as some considerations for computational complexity like we talked about. And then kind of the authoritative textbook treatment is Quantum Computation and Quantum Information by Nielsen and Chung. And that uh, is a very much a, a kind of considered the Bible of the industry. Uh, there's an online course that's very good. It's on the EDX platform. Uh, called Quantum Information Science is offered by MIT. It's a series of courses. It's uh, worth checking out. Uh, I'm, you know, obviously, Wikipedia is a good resource if you're introduced to some new vocabulary. Uh, and then uh, Stephen Hawking, if you're interested in the, the history of quantum dynamics and the science behind it, he collected a series of papers in a book called The Dreams That Stuff Is Made Of. It's a really neat resource. Uh, and then um, I blog on Medium, and uh, this talk was actually an adaption uh, of uh, a paper I published in 2016 called Quibbling Over Qubits. And if you'd like to learn more, that's a good place to check out too. Uh, so before I jump into quantum machine learning, uh, are there any questions with respect to quantum computing in general? Just an observation. This seems to be a difficult uh, area to learn. So <laughs> am I right? <laughs> I mean, it's not something you can learn overnight, but it's, uh, it, uh, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, using the right resources. If, if you uh, follow, you know, popular press accounts, you're not going to learn anything. I mean, 
it, it, they'll state a thousand different ways that a qubit is a bit in superposition, but they won't tell you much else. So it's just a matter of getting your hands on the right resources. Is, is there something you suggest, like uh, you know, something for dummies or? <laughs> <laughs> well, the I mean, the quantum computing since Democritus is a very accessible work, and uh, there's also uh, a, a lot of public lectures out there. Uh, that are on YouTube, uh, uh, you know, Scott Aronson, uh, Michael Nielsen, uh, John Preskill, I think has some lectures out there. And uh, yeah, there's not a lot of really, uh, uh, you know, very good that I found kind of introductory resources like targeting undergrads maybe, but uh, you know, if, if you're willing to spend a little time and effort, it's, it's you know, it, the information's out there. It's just a matter of finding it. So just an assumption, you need, you need to understand advanced mathematics before you understand quantum computing, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's linear algebra. It's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's vectorized matrices, you know, subject to some constraints. And uh, it's, um, I mean, I'm oversimplifying it, but <laughs> that's, yeah. that's kind of a, a way any, to think about it. Any, any knowledge of physics required? It helps. I mean, like I said, I kind of took it for advantage that some of the concepts of quantum dynamics, uh, you know, th there's a lot of good introductory material for quantum dynamics. And if you'd like to learn more about, uh, you know, some like uh, just, you know, Googling things like the, uh, the dual split, a uh, dual slit experiment uh, is there's a lot of good resource. And that's like a really illustrative uh, type of uh, experiment to kind of see what kind of strange properties are exhibited by quantum systems. Okay, thanks a lot. Great, great presentation so far, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm struggling most with, I think, the, the, the starting, getting out of the starting blocks, understanding superposition and kind yeah. of, you know, really having some kind of visual or intuitive understanding of that. And I don't know, is is that something that you just have to get over when you're starting to think about quantum things? And well, just... and that's why I, I try to start with the block sphere because it's it, it it's uh it's the most intuitive way I found to think about what it means when we say that a qubit is in superposition because there's this range of states and as you get towards the top of the sphere, uh, your classical probability of collapsing to uh, one state gets closer to 100 percent, and as you get towards the bottom of the sphere your probability of collapsing to the other gets it. So it's a, it's kind of a quantum analog of classic probability expanded for additional dimensions, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, such that it, it's, a, it's like, it's like a classic probability, but it has a positive and negative values as well as real and imaginary components. Mm -hmm. And do all of the implementations that you mentioned uh, map to this block sphere, is that uh, fundamental to all of quantum computing or uh, are there variants of the block sphere that, uh, that depend on the underlying physics and properties of, of, at the quantum level? So I gave an illustration of uh, one set of universal quantum gates. Uh, and uh, this is not the only set of universal quantum gates. It's possible to have a much smaller set of gates that you can still achieve universal computation. Uh, but in practicality, uh, you know, the, uh, you'll want to make use of, of uh, you know, I'm not really an expert on quantum gates quite as much, but uh, uh, there's more than one potential set of universal gates. And, uh, you know, with the adiabatic computing version, you don't have a universal set. And that's why you're kind of uh, subject to just specialized applications. Uh, then with this, the architectures that are, that are being offered by the likes of Rigetti and IBM, uh, they target universal gate-based quantum computation. Okay, and uh, where does the, the, the vector come from? Is it analogous to in classical computers, um, you know, a bus or some, you know, you've got n qubits wide or, you know, that's your, your bandwidth, your bus uh, size? Well, your, the, the dimensionality of your system is uh, a function of the number of qubits. And, you know, uh, the, the Hilbert space is how you describe the dimensionality. Uh, subject, one qubit has uh, possible states after measurement of zero or one. So that's a two-dimensional system. And then for every additional qubit you incorporate, 
you increase the the dimensionality su such that it's a uh, two to the n gives you the dimensionality of the system. So it's it's more of like an informational uh, capacity. Uh, you know, as far as uh, the transmission of quantum states uh, through a channel uh, and in a circuit, uh, I, I, the physical realization of that, I'm less an expert on. Okay. Well, two to the n is still. I mean, that's just the the uh, the capacity of uh, you know some number of qubits in terms of binary representations. Yeah, it's the dimensionality and like the the block sphere, which is a single qubit in superposition. Even though it's like a 3D picture, because your superposition is constrained to the to the outer rim of the sphere, it's actually a two dimensional system because it can be described as with just two angles, and so. Uh, okay. A block sphere is a two-dimensional state. Okay. Other questions? Uh, um, yeah, how do these qubits uh, interact with each other? Uh, I mean, it's uh, it, the different architectures have uh, different uh, tools for, for gate application. Uh, the actual physical manifestations, I'm, I'm less of an expert on. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, Sebastian. Sure. Okay, well, let's go ahead and jump on into the second half of the talk. Uh, this, I think this, this, this half is a little bit shorter, but uh, th this is uh, an overview of a recently published paper, uh, which uh, addresses the intersection of quantum computing and machine learning. Uh, it's a paper uh, by Jacob Biamonte, uh, as well as Wittek, Pencati, Rebentross, Weib, and Lloyd. Uh, and I, I wanna put an asterisk that I based my review, uh, partly to avoid copyright issues, as well as stuff like that, uh, on as well as I don't have access to a university library. <laughs> so I, I based my review on the preprint that's available on archive, which is actually uh, uh, a little outdated, I'm sure. The, the actual paper was published in September of 2017. It, it's a rapidly progressing field. I, I definitely highly recommend if you have professional interests to check out the, the, the published version uh, that was in the Nature Journal. Uh, that being said, I'm gonna include in my slides uh, numbering for citations. Uh, if you're interested in reading more about any of this specific subject matter, uh, the uh, numbering convention of the citations is based on the archive preprint, uh, which is, uh, there's the number here if you'd like to see the preprint. Uh, also, another asterisk is that I took a little uh, more of a creative license in the slide preparation here. Uh, so th there's a little more, uh, uh, you know, illustrations that aren't necessarily directly related to the material that are just being provided for color. So uh, I hope you'll grant me a little leeway from that standpoint. But uh, I'll go ahead and jump right on in. Um, the paper is meant to address the intersections of quantum computing and machine learning. And, and so uh, one of the key points of the paper is that that, uh, that interface of quantum computing and machine learning actually goes in both directions. And that uh, using classical machine learning resources it helps us to understand and control quantum systems. And then parallel, uh, using quantum computational devices, it gives us the ability to enhance the performance of machine learning algorithms for problems beyond the reach of classical computing. So this is a really cool Venn diagram that's included in the preprint that I don't think made it into the final published version. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. I just wanted to call out that it's a really neat visualization. Uh, and the idea is that the categories on the left represent categories of machine learning. Uh, the right represents quantum information processing. And then the intersection of quantum machine learning is the subject matter addressed by this paper. Uh, I'm not gonna cover the entirety of the paper. It's definitely uh, more than this time slot would allow. Uh, I'm just going to offer some highlights. So some of this, uh, if you'd like to learn more, you know, I'd suggest checking out the paper. What I will cover is, uh, I'll just offer a quick flavor of classical machine learning methods being applied to quantum systems. Uh, I'll talk about using quantum computing devices to enhance our machine learning algorithms. And then I'll also talk about some of the frontiers in quantum machine learning uh, as addressed by the paper. 
So first we'll talk about using classical machine learning and quantum systems. And I'll just provide one example just to give you a flavor. Uh, so when a researcher is studying a quantum system, uh, it's generally in a lab environment and the goal is to design, develop, benchmark, and control that quantum system. And uh, uh, quantum computers is the example we'll focus on. And, and just as a reminder, I, I'm not sure if I really addressed this with sufficiency in the first half, is that the whole idea of quantum computers is that once we've reached sufficient scale and implementation, we'll be able to achieve quantum supremacy, which is basically uh, the, the fact that we'll allow for exponential speed up versus classical computers in select applications. So as far as using classical machine learning methods and to uh, uh, develop quantum computers, uh, one of the key areas is in the design of quantum gates. You know, we talked about the gate implementations in the first half of the talk, uh, and it turns out that the actual physical realization of these gates is a challenge uh, for uh, quantum computers. And uh, it's being uh, uh, supported with the use of supervised learning techniques as well as reinforcement learning techniques. So, uh, you know, that's an example of quantum or um, of classical machine learning algorithms uh, improving our quantum systems. So now we'll talk about uh, quantum enhanced machine learning. And uh, this is obviously the meat of the paper and the, uh, I guess the purpose of the meetup. So uh, the paper addresses uh, two ways that uh, quantum mechanics can uh, enhance machine learning. Uh, one is that uh, uh, quantum computers can perform machine learning algorithms, uh, problems that are outside the reach of classical computers. And uh, the paper gives examples in big data techniques. It gives examples in adiabatic optimization, as well as uh, examples in Gibbs sampling. And, and I'll talk about each of these uh, going, going forward. Uh, the paper also addresses some other things that I'm not going to address, but uh, I just want to call out that it's in the paper. It mentions that some of the techniques developed in evaluating quantum systems can improve machine learning algorithms. And it talks about tensor networks and renormalization techniques and Bayesian networks. So those are, uh, if you'd like to learn more, those are in the paper. And it's just an interesting tidbit that some uh, additional avenues of using uh, quantum uh, techniques can enhance our machine learning. So for the example of applying quantum computing resources to big data problems, uh, the, the paper offers two ways to realize quantum speedups and the performance of uh, big data problems. One is with respect to uh, query complexity. Uh, basically, we talked about earlier the Grover search algorithm, which is a way to provide a quadratic speed up uh, for some database search application. And through the application of Grover search algorithm, uh, the number of algorithmic queries to an information storage medium can be reduced. Uh, and then another way that big data speed ups can be realized is uh, through uh, uh, gate complexity, such that the number of elementary gates to obtain your results, uh, and that's realized uh, via a type of uh, quantum technique for finding matrix eigenvalues. Uh, that's not to say that the application of big data with quantum computers is simple. Uh, it turns out the key challenge is that before we can perform a quantum computation on some set of big data, we actually have to load the quantum, uh, the state into the quantum computer. And this is actually what can dominate the cost of the algorithm. Uh, and so, uh, the, the paper offers two ways this can be addressed. One is uh, using a, a pre-trained generative model, and then it also talks about so loading the data into a low-depth circuit for accessing the data uh, using quantum RAM, uh, QRAM, uh, and you know, there's a citation there if you'd like to learn more. So we've talked about big data. Let's now talk about the special purpose application of adiabatic optimization, which uh, we talked about in the first half of the talk. Uh, so adiabatic optimization, also known as quantum annealing, uh, is uh, basically a way to address a constrained optimization problem. And in so doing, it's restating the problem in the form of an icing model, uh, which uh, just a quick flavor of what we mean when we talk about an icing model. It's a way to model a set of uh, elements with pairwise interactions of spin states uh, subject to excitation by temperature, uh, just like a magnet uh, if you heat it enough, it loses its magneticity in parallel. If you lower uh, the temperature, it reaches its low energy state. And so an icing model is just a generalized version of that pairwise interaction of spin states. And adiabatic optimization 
is a way to embed an optimization problem into a physical system such that once it reaches that low energy state, that it stores the problem solution. And the operation of adiabatic optimization is realized uh, in two ways, uh, via thermal fluctuations, uh, as well as uh, by quantum tunneling, which takes advantage of the superposition and state space of the fitness landscape. So the paper gives a few examples of some systems that have been demonstrated using adiabatic quantum computing. Uh, it doesn't go into a lot of detail, it just kind of cites you to external resources, and so I'll, I'll give it the same treatment. But some of the examples that it offers include uh, boosting algorithms, a natural language processing, anomaly detection, uh, probabilistic graphical models, manifold learning, and maximum entropy model. And so these are all examples of the types of machine learning applications that have been addressed with adiabatic quantum computing. And you know, this is current as of like 2017, I assume. Did the paper quote any specific results for any of those? Uh, it, it just, uh, it, it kind of just illustrated, hey, here's, uh, here's the type of applications that have been addressed using adiabatic resources. Uh, okay. So it, it, you know, I've included citation numbering here. So it, I guess the intent is if, if you'd like to learn more about any of these specific applications, this gives you uh, some, some channels to do so. Mm -hmm. Ankur asked a question in the chat, can you give specific examples of problems that can't be solved by classical computers that can be with quantum? Uh, do you get to that in, uh, in the slides or do you have a specific example that comes to mind or do we even like, have we characterized the problem enough to, to really articulate that yet? Yeah, I'm going to get some more. Uh, I mean, in the big data techniques, uh, what's being demonstrated is that, uh, uh, there's uh, speed ups uh, of, uh, of, of uh, performing big data applications. And so uh, those, are, those are speed ups that are not uh, available with classical resources. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, yeah, I'm going to get to more of those types okay. of things. Uh, so uh, we talked about uh, you know, where we left off, we were talking about uh, adiabatic uh, computing and applications in machine learning. And, and so I'll, I'll just uh, talk further about this adiabatic uh, quantum annealing operation. And, and uh, you know, one important point is that in theory, uh, quantum annealers should provide uh, a global minimum of your fitness landscape. And it's, it, in theory, the output would be a global optimum. Uh, in practice, there's a number of implementation issues that deviate from the theory. And so, uh, in reality, after you perform your adiabatic optimization, uh, you end up with energy levels that follow a Gibbs distribution, which is a type of probability distribution. Uh, so Gibbs sampling is a way using classical resources to uh, using Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques to uh, evaluate and sample from that distribution to model that equilibrium probability distribution. And then it turns out there's also a quantum equivalent of that sampling technique called quantum Gibbs sampling. And through that, uh, it's possible to evaluate a Gibbs distribution. So this Gibbs distribution, it turns out, is, uh, is useful, uh, is relevant to Boltzmann machines. And uh, just a quick rehash, Boltzmann machines uh, is a type of neural network architecture that uh, instead of using a deterministic activation function, like logistic or ReLU, for instance, uh, the activation functions are stochastic units, such that uh, if, if you have an output of a neuron, it won't be a defined value. It'll be subject to some probability distribution. Uh, and then uh, uh, the Boltzmann machines uh, are generally trained uh, using a Gibbs sampling technique, which we just talked about. Uh, so uh, they can be trained uh, using classical resources, and it turns out they can also be trained using adiabatic quantum computers uh, for training uh, bolster machines. Uh, however, there's one key difference, and that is that uh, with classical methods of training bolster machines, uh, you're limited to restricted bolster machines, which is subject to, uh, uh, although you're allowed for interconnectivity between adjacent hidden rows, uh, a restricted bolster machine does not allow for interconnectivity within the neurons within the same row. And then uh, with 
the key, one of the key findings that I, I thought was of importance was that uh, with quantum Gibbs sampling, uh, you can now, uh, we'll now have the ability to efficiently train deep networks of non-restricted Boltzmann machines. And so that means that uh, uh, it's, it's, we basically have a whole new class of neural network architecture uh, using quantum resources that weren't available to us previously, which, uh, you know, it strikes me as a big deal. I, I, I don't know firsthand, you know, if, you know, some of the applications, but, uh, you know, anytime you have a whole new class of neural network architecture, that just seems like a big deal. Uh, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about some of the frontiers in quantum machine learning. Um, the, the paper cites a few additional experiments uh, of, that have been uh, performed uh, using uh, quantum resources and machine learning applications. Uh, it, you know, the, the last set of experiments I listed were all adiabatic computing. Some of these make use of gate-based computing methods. Uh, and, uh, and again, the, the paper doesn't go into a lot of detail about the actual realizations of these demonstrations, but uh, it cites external resources if you'd like to learn more. And it uh, illustrates uh, examples in speaker recognition, chaotic time series prediction, uh, classifiers, and input encodings, uh, and as well as things like uh, simulating a chain of trapped ions and regularized boosting methods. Uh, so as far as what we'll close by just talking about some of the frontiers. Uh, quantum computers uh, can outperform classical ones in some machine learning tasks, uh, but kind of going back to the first half of the talk, we talked about the computational complexity profile and how the boundaries of the bounded quantum polynomial set, the BQP set, uh, we don't know with certainty. And that's kind of what's being discussed here is that the full scope of the power of quantum computers is not known with certainty. So, it, you know, there's still research to be done and uh, still learning to be done. Uh, and then another highlight that I took away is that, uh, you know, one of the key points of the paper is that uh, quantum computing and machine learning will co-evolve and that as we improve our, our machine learning methods, uh, it'll help us to design and evaluate quantum states and quantum computing and in parallel as we improve our quantum computers, they'll be enabling for certain classes of machine learning. Uh, some additional resources I'd recommend. Uh, if you'd like to learn more from, just give me a chance to highlight some books I liked from uh, the machine learning realm. Uh, Deep Learning with Python uh, is written by the, uh, the architect behind the Keras framework, uh, Francois Trollet. And uh, it's a very accessible work that uh, balances kind of considerations for, uh, for uh, beginners as well as some considerations for researchers. And so uh, it's, it's a balanced work and, and it's, uh, it's well done. Uh, if for a kind of authoritative textbook treatment, uh, obviously everyone here has heard of Deep Learning by Goodfellow, Bengio, and Corville. Uh, it's still uh, state of the art for, for the most part. Uh, and then, um, you know, obviously we talked about earlier Fast AI, and that's a good online course. Uh, I, I have found that just at least dipping your toes into the archive stream, uh, computer science AI from time to time is a good way to get exposure to papers you might not see otherwise. Uh, and then, you know, this paper was published in the Nature Journal, uh, and uh, Nature is actually uh, coming out with a, a dedicated machine learning journal, uh, which will start in January of 2019. So uh, given their treatment of quantum computing, I've, you know, I have high expectations for what that's going to look like. Uh, and then obviously, I, I, I blog as well. Uh, I, I've done a lot of writing on machine learning. Uh, the first kind of uh, dedicated address of the topic was a post called From the Diaries of John Henry. Uh, so if you'd like to see more, that's a good resource. And that's all I have. So covered a lot of ground. Any questions? Questions for Nick? You definitely covered a lot of ground. There's a side <laughs> conversation on uh, Slack about how many drinks we're going to need to fully recover <laughs> after this and well, uh, it's going to take for this stuff to sink in. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Oh, of course. Yeah, I mean, great job uh, tackling what is undoubtedly a very challenging topic. In fact, the intersection of two really tough topics, if not more. So a quantum number, a quantum uh, <laughs> number of tough topics. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, exponential slowdown <laughs> as you get more uh, more stuff. But uh, it's... Uh, 
And the goal was really just to kind of give you guys uh, some of the basic vocabulary of what it means when we talk about quantum computing. And so hopefully, you know, you'll have a better idea of what it means when we talk about a qubit and superposition and things like that. Nick asks, are there any, are there simulators or virtual machines available which uh, would allow us to kind of do a, a toe dip into this world? Yeah, well, I, I mentioned some of the commercial resources that are available. Uh, I, I know that, uh, uh, you know, I, IBM, uh, the Q experience has a, a simulator as well as uh, actual, you know, real quantum computing resources that are available to test. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Rigetti does as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, there are also other uh, open source resources and things like that that are out there. Uh, uh, you know, it's, I, I think your best bet is to, you know, you know, exploring what uh, some of the commercial providers are offering, and they'll have things like simulators as well as actual quantum systems you can interface with in the cloud. Uh, Nick, uh, I have a question. Uh, similar to how uh, Google has, you know, they have the TPU, I think, tensor processing unit. Are people looking at uh, developing these things on chips, you know, so that I mean, or uh, because what I what I what I can see is this is really a completely new physical architecture. So, so some of the realizations of the physical architectures are uh, at, at different scales. I, I think that uh, uh, some of the the providers with expertise in silicon production are probably uh, investigating more along that channel. Uh, there are, you know, different types of architectures that are being investigated. Just a quick follow-up question. How far are we uh, from, you know, commercial applications being available to end users? Is it a decade away, a couple of decades away, or five years, ten years? What is it? Well, I mean, first we have to demonstrate quantum supremacy, which is, uh, you know, we haven't, uh, no one's published that I've seen yet uh, a demonstration of actually achieving the exponential speed up that's expected uh, once we reach sufficient scale of qubits. And so uh, once we've reached, you know, that scale, uh, then there's definitely potential. But I mean, there's the type of applications, I, like it's, I didn't really talk about it as much here because uh, it's not a, it wasn't really as stressed as much in the preprint, but the, the nature version of this paper talks about uh, principal component analysis uh, that is uh, available using even the type of scale of qubits that are available on the market today. So that's uh, uh, even using today's resources, I think there's some applications that uh, are, are, are available. Okay, thanks. Great presentation. Thank you. There's a question, there's a question from Fadi on Slack. Any thoughts on how this might influence uh your other area of interest renewable en energy <laughs> yeah i mean it's uh it's yeah you know, i i try to uh uh you know uh spread my net pretty wide so uh it, it uh it, obviously the goal is to find some uh some some intersections uh and you know working on that <laughs> to be continued yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, Nick, thank you. This was a, a really great, uh, really great conversation. Lots more to uh, dig into, I think, for a lot of us here. Um, but uh, certainly appreciate all of the pointers to resources and, and other things as well. Uh, so thank you. Did I, did I make it enough time? Are we doing okay on time? Uh, no, we're a little bit over, but uh, given the complexity of the topic, um, you know, I, I you know, kind of let it slip a little bit. I appreciate uh, the leeway. Yeah, we're 10 minutes over, uh, but, uh, you know, you're active on, on Slack, so if folks have follow-up discussion or questions or discussion, I'm sure they can find you on the, uh, the, the Meetup channel uh, on Slack. And... Uh, uh, Nick will make sure the slides get posted there. We'll make sure that the recording gets posted there. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. It was a great Thanks time. for the opportunity. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.